Hello and good afternoon or morning from wherever you're joining us. Thank you so much for tuning into this virtual panel discussion with early career and PA leaders led by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we're very excited to talk to our panelists from across government agencies, NGOs, and academia about both their professional experiences in their careers and current topics in the field of marine protected areas. My name is Devin Lombard Henley, and I'm a current John A. Knauss Fellow through NOAA's Sea Grant Program. I'm placed with the Marine Program at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Washington, D.C. I'm originally from Seattle, Washington, and I am a lifelong sailor, licensed captain, and tide pool enthusiast. Um, I am very excited to introduce our panelists today, starting with Kylie Asko. Um, Kylie is a scientist and diver from Kanaohe, Oahu, and is pursuing a PhD in environmental life sciences at Arizona State University while based in Hilo, Hawaii. As a NOAA Nancy Foster Scholar, she integrates coral reef ecology, 3D photogrammetry, and scientific diving with indigenous science. For the last 10 years, Kylie has conducted long-term monitoring and 3D modeling with the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. Kylie honors her native Hawaiian heritage by using innovative technologies to understand and manage coral reef responses to climate change. Our second panelist is Sam Tolkien. Uh, she is a research analyst, sorry, a resource management specialist at NOAA's Stella Wagon Bank National Marine Sanctuary. Her work includes assessing the impact of activities on sanctuary resources and developing and implementing management programs and policies to protect, enhance, and conserve the sanctuary and its resources. She received a bachelor's degree in marine biology from Roger Williams University and a master's in business administration and environmental policy from the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth. Our third panelist is Jackie Sadowski. Jackie is an American conservation experience visitor service intern working for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the Northeast region and assisting with the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument. She's been an active member in the monument's management planning process and leading outreach and engagement since fall of 2022. Jackie's background includes a BS in wildlife ecology with a concentration in wildlife science and management from the University of Maine. She previously worked for the Massachusetts Audubon Society and interned with the, Na the National Wildlife Refuge System. And last but not least, our fourth panelist, Grace Revell. Grace is the regional lead for the Blue Nature Alliance's U.S. High Seas Engagements. Originally from the shores of Long Island Sound, Grace's lifelong love of the ocean led her to study marine science at Colby College and later pursue a master's degree in environmental management from Yale University School of the Environment. She's in there's like 30 some people in there. Right. So sorry. Uh, if you could please mute yourself if you are an audience member, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, see. Grace pursued a master's degree in environmental management from Yale's University School of the Environment. She's a marine conservation practitioner with experience working closely with communities, governments, and civil society to advance ocean conservation efforts at various scales. Thank you so much to all of our amazing panelists. Um, with that, I'm going to get started with our first question, um, which is just if each of you can please tell us a little more about your background outside of what I just mentioned and how you got started personally working in marine protected areas. Um, let's start with Kylie. Aloha, everyone. My name is Kylie. I come from Kaneohe Bay, Oahu, and I, um, and then, you know, I come from a family that relies on coral reefs for sustenance and recreation for many generations. So I grew up in the ocean 
and I've seen the declines over the years. So that's what instilled science method for me because I want to help prepare my people on the islands when we witness more impacts from climate change. My undergraduate was with the University of Hawaii at Hilo, and we have this really great uh, NOAA program called Quest, which is a scientific diving program. And from this program, you have the opportunity to apply for an internship um, with the Papahānaumokuakea Marine National Monument. And you are taken on as a professional scientist to conduct coral reef long-term monitoring. And so that's where it all kind of started for me in MPA. We had a, a research cruise that went to the monument back in 2015 when I started. And I've kind of been asked back every year um, to help monitor the reefs and then also lead some research and analysis for them. Um, throughout, throughout my um, academic career, I've kind of led community research. And what I mean by that is I have community members kind of help me drive my research questions instead of just me coming in as a scientist and deciding what I would like to do off of personal preference. And so I kind of just hope to better coral reefs management around many different MPAs through my research questions and yeah, hopefully give back that information to the community. Thank you so much. Um, Sam, can we hear from you next? Yeah, sure. My work in marine protected areas started about a year ago with Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. I grew up in Massachusetts in Cape Cod along the ocean, and I've always had a great appreciation for a natural environment and the marine environment. Um, I went to school, I got a degree in marine biology, and after college, I immediately started working in the field as a fisheries observer. And since then, my career has been mostly um, NOAA fisheries and fisheries related jobs. However, I've also done a little oil spill response efforts and protected species work on construction projects like offshore wind development. Um, I've always been interested in the sanctuaries and the National Marine Sanctuary System. I recently went back to school. I got an MBA in environmental policy and had the opportunity to join Stellwagen. And although I have a much greater fisheries background, I think a lot of that experience has been relevant to my position here. Thank you. Jackie, how about you? Hi, everyone. Um, my background consists of just loving the marine world. I grew up going to the Cape every summer. I'm from Massachusetts as well, Sam. So um, when I went to college, I went for a wildlife ecology because I love terrestrial, terrestrial animals as much as I love marine animals. And I was able to spend a lot of time in Acadia National Park and being on the coast over there for different laboratories. So that was really exciting. My venture into the marine protected areas uh, kind of started in 2022, as Devin mentioned, when I joined Fish and Wildlife Service at our regional office in the Northeast in Massachusetts, I was asked to join the Squid Squad um, to help with the management plan for the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument. So it was kind of a happy accident and I'm really happy that it led to this because the marine protected area world is so special and I'm so happy to be a part of it. And last but not least, Grace. Yeah, thanks. Um, and similar to everyone here, I grew up with all over the ocean. I also really loved tide pools as a kid and just have really fond memories growing up, splashing around in them as a little one. Um, but I never really thought about it as an academic interest until I was in college and I went snorkeling for the first time on a field studies course and it just blew my mind. I was like, why did nobody tell me about how amazing coral reefs are? Um, and I really thought that I was destined for a life of being a lab rat and also snorkeling and scuba diving. Um, but I studied abroad and it sounds a little cliche, but it really just opened my eyes um, to community-based conservation. Um, I studied in Zanzibar, Tanzania, and um, living and kind of working in this community just really changed my perspective on, um, on my own personal future, but also on the conservation um, 
world as a whole. And so following that experience, I wanted to kind of explore that more deeply. And I ended up um, following graduation, going into the Peace Corps. And I spent two years living and working in the Philippines with um, a really small scale fishing community. Um, and I worked with these fisher folk who wanted to set up really small scale marine protected areas. And so that was really my introduction to MPAs. And I, I learned so much from just living and working in that community. Um, and I'm just so grateful for the experience of being introduced to marine protected areas by fishers, because I think so commonly today we see the fishing community uh, kind of at odds with conservation. And that's really just, that's not at all the place where I learned about MPAs. And so I, I love that that was my introduction to the community and the space. That's really cool. Thank you. Um, we're going to get into some more questions about your uh, early career and leadership experiences. And if we could just go in the same order, so Kylie, Sam, Jackie, and then Grace. Um, first question is, how are your educational experiences and your other work experiences valued in your professional field? Um, there was definitely kind of three things that I think kind of helped me grow as a professional. Um, one was, as I mentioned, that program that Noah provided um, that really instilled scientific scuba diving methods into me, but also taught me kind of just the methodology of science. And then there was another one, another NOAA-funded um, program called Ku'ula, which was a traditional knowledge integration into Western science. And it was a local, it was for local students here in Hawaii. And it kind of like instilled confidence into us as uh, scientists, because often we feel that we're not good enough, but we have all this knowledge, you know, that has been passed down to us and how to incorporate that into our scientists was really empowering for our cohort. So I felt like that really kind of helped me lead my path in science and help my community and also just the MPAs that I work in. So growing as a academic um, and going into my PhD, I was able to receive the NOAA Nancy Foster Scholarship, which is a scholarship for masters and doctors uh, or PhD students. And it's funded by the Office of Natural Marine Sanctuaries but it teaches us science communication. And so each year we have a big kind of meeting somewhere around America and we practice different science communication um, techniques, which is super important because as scientists, we need to be able to communicate our findings to others and also politicians or managers. And so I feel like those experiences and this scholarship really kind of helped me grow professionally. In, in general, I think my work experiences and education are valued in my profession at the sanctuary because um, I bring a unique perspective based on my education and my work experiences and background. And everybody has a, a different background and has um, seen or interacted with different people and has different work experiences. And I think that's really important. The sanctuary system has a diverse staff and I think bringing those different perspectives is really important. Yeah, similar to my two fellow panelists who just went, I feel like with my experiences, since my undergrad was wildlife, ecology with wildlife science and management in totality, more terrestrial rather than just marine. Um, I feel like this biology work that I learned through my labs and data collection really led me to want to communicate that better. And at school, I was able to join the Wildlife Society student chapter and where we did lots of outreach to elementary schools and other um community members where it really opened my eyes to how important it is to get conservation messages spread wide, like spread out through the communities. And 
um, that really like shifted my gears towards visitor services, which I'm in now. Um, and I think it's super important for the monument that I work for that it's an excellent way to how to communicate this biology work with different areas. Like I travel to a lot of the coastal refuges and I'm able to communicate the different means and methods of some of this biology work that's going on with research cruises to the local communities and it's really exciting and I feel like that kind of background of biology and being able to communicate is really important. Yeah and for me reflecting back on all of my different work and um, academic experiences I think the most significant lesson I've learned has been from my time in Peace Corps because I spent so much time living and working in this community. And what I realized throughout the two years I was there was just how little I actually knew at the end of two years about a community that I felt so connected to. And um, almost like the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. <laughs> um, and I think that that kind of mindset shift of, um, you know, understanding a place before working on projects, one of the main um, approaches that Peace Corps applies is that, you know, for your about your first year that you're there, you're not supposed to attempt any projects. You're supposed to work on just integrating into the community, learning the language, meeting as many people as you can, and just really understanding the context that you're then going to work in and, and work on projects that are relevant and contextualized. Um, and I really just value that approach so much. And it's something that I've really taken um, to heart and I continue to think about every day in, in my work now. Um, and, you know, a, a kind of phrase we use on our team a lot is that progress moves at the speed of trust. And I feel like to get trust from communities where you're looking to lift up their values and their um, goals for marine protected areas and other area-based protections, I think you really have to understand the context and be willing to um, admit that you're not going to know everything, but go in and um, have kind of that really concerted effort to understand the context before you start to work on something. Um, so I think that, yeah, that's that's generally the, the approach that my team takes. And I think it is really valued and marrying that with kind of the science background and kind of the conventional Western lab science has um has been a really nice way to kind of bring all those pieces of my kind of professional and academic background together. Great, thank you so much. Um, next question for each of our panelists. Um, what advice would you give to someone wanting to work in the field of marine protected areas? Um, I think it's just important to be open and, you know, take some risk. And what I mean with that is, you know, maybe you want to try something new and in, in, I guess in anything, your professional field, your life. And I think you should do it, you know, you should get out and try something new. I think even with science, I'm always trying to learn new things. Um, like part of my PhD is DNA. I don't even know eDNA, environmental DNA, but I'm going out and I'm putting myself out there and learning new things and networking with different people to learn about it. So I think, yeah, being open and taking risk is good. That is good advice. Um, I would also say there's opportunities to volunteer or intern for marine protected areas and sanctuaries. Um, the other advice I would offer is if there's a specific geographic region you're interested in, a specific ecosystem or a species that's really uh, meaningful to you, get to know and understand um, MPAs in that vein and understand the challenges that those MPAs are presented with. No two areas are the same. They have different challenges, different stressors, uh, different species and habitats. So Try to find some sort of adjacent work that you could apply to one of those MPAs. And I think that would um, be a great way to get involved and get work experience that can be applied to an MPA career in the future. Yeah. Um, looking back at my experience, I mean, I've always loved the marine world, but I didn't have that in the forefront of my studying when I was an undergrad, but just being able to try to find those opportunities wherever you are within your organization or 
where you're working or where you're trying to connect with, um, happy accidents happen. And so definitely take some risks and just be able to connect and communicate with your leaders and your peers about opportunities you can have that are going into that kind of direction. So that's exactly what I did. And I'm really thankful for it. Yeah, and I think I'm just going to echo everything that was just said, but I would just encourage you to get involved. Um, go and participate in your local process and go to public hearings, go to meetings, um, meet with, you know, everyone you can to talk about it. Because I think if you cast a wide net, you're going to get a really great exposure to all the different ways that you could get engaged in this um, type of community. Awesome. That's all really great advice. Thank you so much. Um, I also wanted to ask as four impressive and amazing young women, how um, or what role has gender played in your career or professional development thus far? Um, I think we, you know, as females, we bring in a different energy that can be like nurturing and, but also kind of hold you to your standards and produce work. And I think like often we're quiet leaders, which are super important in a kind of group dynamic. So I think it's been good overall. Um, I just try to stay kind of true to myself and, you know, not try to be too crazy in situations, but um, hold my head strong and when it comes to difficult situations, I feel. I feel like for me, being a female in the sciences, especially starting my career as a fisheries observer, um, it's a job that's in a field setting in a male dominated fishing industry. Um, I think it made me more determined to succeed and prove that females can rise to the challenge, especially in a field environment. Um, and I think I've carried that mentality along with me through my many other work experiences. And I think that's driven me to accomplish some of the same things I've set out to do. For me personally, um, I've had amazing women role models in all steps for so far, thus far in my career, starting in undergrad. Um, most of my professors were female professors for wildlife courses and my undergraduate coordinator and advisor were females and they really led the way of that we belong in this field and that nothing can stop us if we put our mind to it. Moving forward from that, I worked for Massachusetts Audubon Society, which was started by two amazing women. Um, and my supervisors there were also women. So luckily, I've had really great experiences with supervisors, especially with Fish and Wildlife Service. Both my um, supervisors have been women. So it's been really great to see so many hardworking and determined women above me and being able to strive for those type of careers because I know it's possible. Yeah, and I was going to say something similar to Jackie. I've just had a really great positive experience that's been very female dominated throughout my career, which I love. I've had kind of this sisterhood of women in conservation and even you can see here we're we're all women on this panel. Um, and I've really appreciated that because I feel like we've all lifted each other up and I've been able to see people live out the career that I would like to have myself. And so having those re those role models is um, is really helpful. And I think something to, to aspire to. Um, and they set a really great example. So I'm just really grateful to be surrounded by all these great women. Yeah. Thank you so much for giving us a little bit of insight into your personal experiences in your professional career so far. Um, we're going to shift the questions now to be a little bit more uh, marine protected area focused. So um, the first question in this area I'd like to ask is uh, marine protected areas often cross government jurisdictions and their management involves coordination between multiple co-managers. So how does this structure of management help or hinder the effectiveness of marine protected areas? 
and do you think it could be improved? I guess from a scientist that helps produce research for an MPA, um, I have seen the management, the structure of the management uh, react to emergency situations within Papahanaumokuakea. For instance, a few years back, we found an invasive algae on one of the atolls. And um, within hours, all seven managers had made a decision on what how to move forward. And I thought that was like really great because we're in the middle of the ocean on a boat and they're basically like, do not move, do not come home until we make a decision. And within a few hours, I feel like that is a ton of work to get done from each of the seven managers within Papahanaumokuakea. So I feel like there are times where the management is really successful. Um, I guess, you know, because there's so many managers for one area, it can, you know, take up some time for some of my information as a scientist, the research findings to kind of reach all branches. And um, I hope that we can use like technology, for instance, to share research findings quickly and more of a storyline than a scientific paper, which may be like 15 pages long, or maybe using social media as a different angle to share science results so that it can hit not only the community, but also the managers. So that's kind of my, I guess, uh, way I would hope they that managers could improve using more technology to spread um, awareness of certain things. Yeah, I, I think co-management of MPAs is beneficial because coordination between multiple uh, co-managers brings a greater array of interests and opinions to MPAs. I think that leads to developing solutions for issues uh, that support a greater array of interests and it finds new ways to meet goals a lot more people to work on issues um, wider work experience however i think because of that co-management it also um, bringing more people to the table developing solutions everything takes longer too um, and i think making decisions and implementing actions is a lot slower at times because of that process and I would say to improve that, I think we have to work on ways to work together more efficiently. Yeah, echoing that, I feel like working for Northeast Canyons and Seamounts for co-managed fish and wildlife with NOAA. And every week we have many, many calls that we're talking about with this management plan that just dropped so we've been really busy and it's been really exciting to be able to work with Noah. I haven't had previous experience before this position. So it really opened my eyes, this agency. So I feel like multiple agencies working together gets tasks done at different methods and different ways, but as a collective and we're able to reach different communities working with agencies um, together. But like how others have mentioned, it can take a little more time to communicate. And sometimes communication between two agencies gets a little lost in trans translation between comms and um, some of our headquarters staff working together and it trickling down to regional staff. So, but I think all in all, working together and having multiple people definitely benefits the marine protected areas. Yeah, I think a lot about this challenge and I think about co-management in particular as a really important part of equity in marine conservation. And I, I think a lot about the ways that you can elevate voices from advisory, um, kind of serving in an advisory capacity to actually having decision making authority. And co-management is one of the ways you can do that. Um, I think about Papahanaumokuakea as a great example with OHA, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, as one of the co-trustees, co-managers for the site. Um, and that gives Native Hawaiians decision-making power in the management of the area. And I think that's really, really important um, when we talk about equity and marine conservation. 
Um, but I'm not naive to think that that's like an easy process. And um, I, as everyone else has mentioned, I think better interagency coordination is really important. And I think we also need better resourcing um, for management. So definitely need to ensure that these places are funded um, in order to be able to achieve their management goals. Um, I also think that giving the time and the space and the resources uh, for contextualized community engagement is really important to get community buy-in. And we need to be able to kind of adopt our processes, which can be kind of prescribed and narrow in kind of the federal perspective. But we need to be able to adapt those to the places where we're looking to work so that communities can be truly engaged. Thank you so much. And Kind of building off of that answer, our next question is about how marine protected areas are constantly balancing ecologically significant protections for marine areas with the access and resource needs of local communities. So how have each of you observed this balance in the process of either designation or management of marine protected areas? And what does that balance look like? Um, for Papahanaumokuakea, like Grace said, we have the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, which um, is basically giving the Native Hawaiians a voice for the decisions that happen within the monument, because the monument is our sacred islands. And people have traveled out to these islands for fishing, for sustenance, and also a collection of different um, items off of the islands. For cultural purposes and so um i think the biggest problem we have as native hawaiians is that we want to be heard and also like kind of just put into the realm when decisions are made and so as we are moving forward um you, you know the office of national marine sanctuaries is trying to now label papahanaumokuakea as a sanctuary allowing the public comments and giving us a space to um, speak about what we think about the new de designation is really great because um, most of us really just want our sacred islands to be preserved well and taken care of and we want to know that if the government is going to be um, taking lead with the decisions happening up there that protection is really going to be implemented and make sure that we have an avenue for access if we need it. Um, so there are many different permits you can apply for. And more recently, one of my colleagues just started doing a all Native Hawaiian, um, Native Hawaiian scientists cruise. So they're sailing on a voyage foraging canoe or a um, sailboat up to these islands and that a lot and they had to uh, fly for like four different permits it was a research permit cultural permit conservation permit and another one that I can't remember off the top of my head but you know it's heavily protected and we're willing to go through the steps I just make I think it's just important that everyone knows how to do that if they have um, a purpose of going up there. And sometimes I feel like they don't because many of our people don't know that Apahanamokuakea exists. You'd be like, oh, we have islands past Nihau. And they'll be like, what? We do? And so, um, yeah, I think it's important for MPAs to make sure that they're doing enough outreach and providing, you know, pathways for people to know about the permitting system. Um, I would say I've observed the balance of ecological protection versus resource and access needs um, through the National Marine Sanctuary System because of the inherent um, multiple uses of National Marine Sanctuaries. And um, an example of this balance that comes to mind is each National Marine Sanctuary has a Sanctuary Advisory Council. And um, on that council, there's many different parties involved with some interest um, 
in the sanctuary for scale wagon bank specifically here we have um seats on for representing research students fishing industry maritime heritage um whale watching organizations environmental organizations and uh, as kaylee was saying i think it's really beneficial to bring all sorts of interested um, parties together to discuss issues, appreciate varying interests and opinions, and to try to strike a balance between ecological protections and resource needs. With Northeast Canyons and Seamounts, um, Rain National Monument, I was able to start my position roughly around the public scoping process for the management plan. So it was really informative to be able to connect with the communities that were coming out to our public scoping sessions and hear their concerns. And we had focus groups and table discussions. And it was really great to be able to hear from all different kinds of people who are interested in the management because these marine protected areas are for the American people to enjoy and to conserve and to connect with. So I was really lucky and I was able to really connect with the local communities with these different types of meetings and being able to read all of their comments um, going through the plan. And now that the plan's out, we're excited to continue to have different public meetings to get more people involved with the, the management of the monument and seeing where folks are and trying to just meet them where they're at. Yeah, and I reflect a lot back on what I kind of started uh, this call with, which is just my first exposure to MPAs being from the fisher folk that I worked with in the Philippines. And, you know, these were the people who were closest to the resource and most reliant on it. Um, and, you know, they were the ones that were the fiercest advocates for these MPAs because they knew that they benefited their livelihood long term. Um, so I think a lot about that and I think a lot about how there's so much more that brings us together than that divides us. And at the end of the day, we all want more fish in the ocean. And so if we can reframe some of these conversations and um, be able to have everyone in the room to talk about that and get rid of the disinformation that's out there. Um, and I think that can happen through conversations that can happen through a lot of these management plans focus on outreach and education, as Kylie was talking about. And I think those are really critical so that people feel informed. Um, and, you know, I love MPAs and I think we need more of them and we need to better resource them and better support their implementation to meet their management goals so they can realize their full potential. They're also not a panacea and there are other options out there for other areas um, in addition to MPAs that can complement MPAs that are focused on fisheries management and some of those um, different approaches that, again, complement those MPAs. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, I have one last question. So I would love to know from each of you, what are some hopes and challenges you see for marine protected areas on the horizon? Well, challenges would be um, climate change and some impacts that, you know, we've been seeing around the world, especially for like coral reefs. So I hope, you know, as we experience more of these that we go in with the mentality that with some rest to the ecosystem it will naturally sort of bounce back slowly and um, using the science and different perspectives of stakeholders um, should be incorporated when we as we move forward with MPAs but um, personally I have seen Reefs been destroyed in Papahanaumokuakea, and within a year they bounce back. There's new corals growing, the fish are coming back. So I think it's just important to remember that our coral reefs are resilient, even though they are seeing more impacts. Is this? Uh, I'll start with some challenges for MPAs and then turn it around to some hopes. Um, I think human caused stressors are going to continue to be a challenge for MPAs. There's localized issues like fishing, shipping, underwater noise, and there's global issues like climate change. And a challenge is going to be how we address those impacts and how do we adequately 
protect and conserve these areas um, and make meaningful decisions in a timely manner. Um, as for hope, um, from my experience at National Marine Sanctuaries, I think I think we lost. Oh, you're back, Sam. Mm -hmm. I can't hear you. I'm not sure if it's just me. <laughs> um, let's move to Jackie really quick while we figure out Sam's audio. <laughs> okay. Um, kind of a challenge slash hope together. I think that just getting people more aware of MPAs and their existence and name recognitions of a lot of these places is super important. Um, we really can't do what we want to do and to protect these species and these places without people's support and knowledge of these places. Um, so I think just being able to effectively communicate and outreach for all different types of communities, whether that's inland or that's coastal areas, I think it's super important and that's something that is going to be an ongoing challenge, but also a hope that we can get more people involved and connected with these places. Thank you. Sam, is your audio back? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. You can finish your, your answer. I don't know where I left off, but all I wanted to say was hopes are um, that we continue to support stewardship and protection. All right, Grace, can you finish this off? Yeah, sure. Um, for me, I am really excited about the new treaty for the high seas. Um, so just thinking about all of the challenges that are associated with international governance of these areas, but um, I really I'm excited and inspired by the potential to kind of break down some of these boundaries that we've created. Our ecosystems don't respect these artificial boundaries that we've put in place, whether they're state, federal, or international. Um, so I'm really excited about the opportunities to pursue marine protected areas that can be more representative of ecosystems and can be more expansive and connect in a network um, all of these different places that we've made efforts to protect already. Thank you. All right, um, we have a couple minutes left if there are any questions from the audience. I don't see any questions in our chat or the Q&A, but does anybody have any, any quick questions? Okay, well. Um, thank you again for joining us and a huge thank you to our amazing panelists. Um, you guys were very insightful and this was so interesting. I'm really glad you could join us. Um, I also wanted to thank the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation for putting on Capitol Hill Ocean Week and this amazing event and also uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, my office, and for, you know, sponsoring the Capitol Hill Ocean Week and putting on this amazing virtual session where we got to learn from these amazing women. And um, that is it. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Devin. Yeah, thank you, Devin. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, everyone.